Thousands of years ago, man discovered that if he blew air through certain heated minerals mixed with carbon, a metal was produced, iron. The principles of iron making are still the same today, but now the process is on a bigger scale. A 150,000 tonne ships bring iron ore to the British Steel Corporation's red car works in Cleveland. The ores come from many parts of the world. The iron is present mainly as iron 3 oxide, but there are many other substances present as well. A complex system of conveyors carries the ore to where it's stacked. The operations are controlled from a central control room overlooking the site. It's important to mix the right ores together in the right proportions to get a suitable mix for the blast furnace. The blended ores are stacked in long heaps. The mixed ores are picked up by this machine to be fed to the next stage in the process. There's the sintering plant where the ores are taken. The blended ores look like this. A lot of coal is also needed. This is turned into coke by heating it in the absence of air. Granulated coke is fed into the sinter plant mixed with the iron ore. In this plant, the ore and coke are heat treated, sintered. The product comes out looking like this, porous lumps through which gases can circulate in the blast furnace. The British Steel Corporation's red car furnace, the biggest in Europe. It's 96 metres high, taller than, for example, a great building like St Paul's Cathedral in London. This is where the sinter, together with large coke, are fed in at the top. This model shows what happens in a blast furnace. It's kept filled from the top with the coke and sinter mixture. Near the bottom, hot air is blown in through jets called tuyères from a main pipe which encircles the furnace. There's a tuyère. And there's another. And here it is on the actual blast furnace. The hot air passes along this huge pipe to the bustle main encircling the furnace. The two years are just below the bustle main and they're set all round the furnace. In the furnace, the coke burns to produce carbon dioxide and heat. The carbon dioxide is reduced by more coke and the carbon monoxide produced reduces some of the iron oxide to iron. Coke also reduces some of the iron oxide, making more iron. The molten iron at over 1,500 degrees C runs to the bottom of the furnace when it can be tapped off. This is called casting. It runs down into a specially designed ladle called a torpedo, which runs on a railway track. Here's a torpedo being hauled into position. Up above, they're about to cast the iron to drill out a plug so that the nearly white hot iron can surge out.
covers are lowered over the river of molten iron to help contain the fumes. The molten iron runs down a refractory lined channel into a movable spout which can be tilted so that the metal flows into the torpedo waiting below. A torpedo holds 250 tons of molten iron. There are impurities in iron ore as well as iron oxide. These react inside the blast furnace to produce a basic slag, which is less dense than the iron and floats on top of it. After a time, this slag starts to emerge from the furnace and it's skimmed off to run down its own channel. Most of this molten slag is run off into special pits. These are cooled by jets of water after each cast. The slag solidifies and is broken into lumps which can be carried away and sold for use in road making, cement manufacture and other civil engineering purposes. Some slag from the blast furnace is run into a plant which converts it into little pellets. The hot liquid slag runs onto water-cooled rollers producing a spray of slag droplets which solidify as little pellets. The pellets, which are much less dense than the pit slag, can be compressed into blocks which are used for heat insulation in new buildings. What used to be an unsightly waste product is now sold and used. Hot gases, nitrogen, carbon dioxide and some carbon monoxide, rise up the furnace and pass into a big pipe at the top. Some of this gas is used as a fuel. This gives some idea of the immense size of the red car blast furnace. The hot gases pass down into a separator and scrubber which removes all the dust particles. Some of this cleaned gas is then burned in huge brick-lined stoves heating up the brickwork. When the brickwork in one stove is hot enough, it's used to heat up the air blast going to the furnace tuyeres. Here are some of the stoves. In industry, heat costs money. It must never be wasted. Once the blast furnace is started up, it's run continuously. It mustn't be allowed to cool down until the furnace has to be relined with new water-cooled refractory material. The whole process is controlled from this room, where the operatives can monitor everything that's happening. The furnace is plugged again while a fresh lot of iron and slag can be cast off from the other side. And here go two torpedoes full of molten iron, 500 tonnes of the hot metal on their way to the steel making plant. This iron from the blast furnace contains about 4% of carbon. Steels contain less than 1% of carbon. Removing most of the carbon makes a lot of difference. Watch this test on an ingot of iron, cast iron, containing about 4% of carbon. In this machine, it can be pulled apart. The needle registers in tons.
the iron suddenly snapped at just under six tons. This is a mild steel containing only about 0.1% of carbon. It behaves very differently in the same test. Watch. Watch as it begins to thin out, to stretch, then... And it took over eight tons, quite a difference from the iron. Let's watch that again. Steel is a much more useful material than the iron from the blast furnace. Let's now see how it's produced by lowering the carbon content of the iron in the torpedoes. We filmed modern steel making at the Scunthorpe plant of the British Steel Corporation. The torpedo contains iron at about 1,500 degrees C, just arrived from one of the Scunthorpe blast furnaces. That's silicon, an impurity in the iron, burning very brightly on the edge of the torpedo. 250 tons of molten iron. They have to remove most, but not all, of the carbon which it contains. But first, another element has to be removed. There's sulphur in the iron from the original ore. This would make the steel useless, so it's got to be got rid of. At this plant, they blow magnesium powder through the molten iron down this pipe, called a lance. The magnesium combines with the sulphur in a very vigorous reaction. When enough magnesium has gone in to remove all the sulphur, the lance is withdrawn. The magnesium has combined with the sulphur to produce magnesium sulphide, which floats on top of the molten iron as a slag. This is scraped off mechanically. This is carefully selected scrap steel. It's going to be used in the process of making new steel from the iron. It's going to be tipped into the great steel making vessel so that it both cools the molten iron slightly when that's poured in later and also it'll break up the jet of hot iron so that it splashes evenly around the inside of the vessel and doesn't damage it. The empty steel-making vessel is still very hot from the last steel-making run. In goes the scrap. Now here comes the molten iron, from which we saw the sulphur removed. Most of the carbon in the iron, depending on the kind of steel to be made, is now burned off as carbon dioxide by blowing oxygen through it down a lance.
At the same time, lime is added to form a slag with other impurities. The fumes produced are all led away in ducts to be cleaned so that as little as possible escapes outside. When enough oxygen, about 170,000 cubic meters of the gas, has been passed through, the vessel is tipped to pour off the slag which has been formed with the lime and which floats on top of the metal. Then the vessel is tipped over the other way to pour out the hot molten steel into a crucible waiting below. Other elements, such as manganese, chromium, aluminium, are added at this stage, again according to the kind of steel required. Remember, steel is iron containing a very small amount of carbon, but other elements are also needed to give different properties. The giant ladle is now brought out and the temperature of the steel is recorded, about 1,650 to 1,730 degrees C. And the noble gas argon is bubbled through the liquid. This stirs it up and because argon is a noble gas, it doesn't react with anything in the ladle. working continuously day and night produces 65,000 tons or more of steel every seven day week. There are other ways of making special steels but the one we've seen, basic oxygen steel making, is the main process for the steels used in the engineering industries. The molten steel is now taken to be cast and rolled into whatever shapes are most suitable for the customers buying this particular batch. By the modern process of continuous casting, all kinds of shapes can be produced. Here, in the rolling mills, you can see how long ingots are rolled out to make them longer and longer as they pass down the mill. The strips these are being made with a V-section, are chopped into convenient lengths for delivery. This is structural steel for the building industry. Many different steels with different compositions are made for a host of different uses. Steel is one of the most important materials in the modern world. And in this film, we've seen how it can be produced in modern iron and steelworks. Chemistry in action on an enormous scale.